Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast, and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated. I don't know quite what to say. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes sometimes people aren't like totally open to the product. Uh-huh. So they're like, oh, no, no, no. and I have to be like, no, just poke it. Just, just take the cap off and poke it. Just poke it? Oh, yeah. No, I, you know, listen. <laughs> listen, I know what to do with this. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know much, but I know what to do with this. <laughs> My old lawyer, one time he had his assistant work on something for me, mm-hmm. and he was, I was like, okay, what do I owe him? Yeah. And the lawyer was like, oh, just give him a flashlight. Right. And I presented him with the flashlight, and he's like, I'm going to keep this on my mantle. Yeah. Next to the products of other people that I've worked on the files. <laughs> right. That's <laughs> so funny. Just imagine, like, I don't know, like gold record, silver record, my flashlight. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like that it's see through. It's really but, cool, right? Yeah. It is actually kind of nice. So they, Angela White <laughs> had her own see through one for like a really long time. Mm-hmm. And then this year, I think it was for Thanksgiving, mm. they took some of the top performers and did clear ones for like a limited edition. Wow. And I was like, I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, sex ed video. What What do you mean? Um, oh, right. So I can like. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah, I can like take like the fact that it's clear to like demonstrate like demonstrate. this is approximately where the G spot oh, is. Right. And like, yeah. Here's a bet where you're going to find the cervix because um, nice. you can see through it. Why can someone buy one of those? Uh, fleshlight.com slash Stoya. Okay, well, yeah. Stoya gave me this, which <laughs> I'm, that very, I'm very touched. <laughs> I'm touched. <laughs> And it's so uh, it's interesting that you talk about the sex ed, and then you bring up um, yeah, like the cervix. It reminds me of your oh, oh gosh, your uh, everything you okay, okay Ehud? Yeah. Ehud's freaked out. We're all freaked out to talk to you, Stoya. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but it, it reminds me of what what your take on um, language not being uh, efficient to describe sexuality and stuff mm. like that. Uh, and I thought that was real interesting. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, I've had similar thoughts about language around narcissistic personality disorder. Okay. Where it's ins- it's insufficient, mm-hmm. you know? And so when I read that or heard you talk about that, I was like, wow, that's cool that you uh, are looking at language that way um, and and trying to go, maybe trying to help it evolve it's occurring to me that mental health and sexuality are two things that we've culturally like not really wanted to deal with for as long as we've had recorded history, mm-hmm. you know, generally speaking in the West. Right. Um, so it makes sense that we would have a lack of precise language around personality disorders and around sexuality. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. That's They're both taboo. Yeah, it's both things that we like we don't converse about very much. So right. obviously we wouldn't have the like robust language that we do for say food. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so have do you have any ideas? Have you like gotten creative with like trying to invent language? I'm um I derp. <laughs> Sorry, I was, no. I was just on the West Coast. I'm a little jet lag. Listen, um, that's good for me. Because like I said, I'm intimidated. So only, it, like, we can be awkward and silent sometimes. Awesome. I only had one and a half cups of coffee this morning. Yeah. I'm still a little like creaky. We can get you one. Really? You yeah, you let, let's get some coffee. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, can any of you people get us coffee? Yeah, I'll ask Hannah. I'll yeah. ask Hannah. People who may hey, just be people. visiting the gallery. No, they all are just visiting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't know them. Some coffee is over here. The space is open from not from twelve to twelve, something like that. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just now noticing the art. So with with language with regard to sexuality, um, I'm currently more taken with the idea of figuring out exactly what porn is first. Yeah. Um, because you know we have the like. I know it when I see it or like, Mm -hmm. you know, like shoe porn, food porn, like Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, But we don't, 
we can't actually describe what pornography is in like a collective definition, like mm-hmm. consensus definition. We can say what it is to us individually, right. but like even then we generally have a hard time articulating like what makes it porn, like whatever. So mm. um, one of the ways I'm going at that is I have a erotically themed book club that happens in Gowanus, Gowanus. once a month yeah. Yeah, called Sex Lit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I used to live over there in, oh, nice. in Red Hook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I lived in Red Hook briefly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where? Yeah. Um, right. You know the coffee shop on Van Brunt that has the antlers for the door handle? Yeah. That, like, two doors down. It's right there. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> How long did you live there? A year. Oh, yeah. There was a, um, a, a bird moved in. Uh huh. That'll happen. Yeah. So someone had, like, <laughs> I had to move out. Like, without the landlord or a construction worker, they'd, like, raise the ceiling. Mm hmm. And put in these, like, storage cubbies. Right. And New Year's Day, I woke up and I had my period. And I was like, it's not an omen. It's not an omen. Mm. And I got in the bathtub. And then I got out of the bathtub and I'm drying off. And the cat, one of the cats, Widget, comes rocketing around the corner, flies into the bathroom, jumps in the tub, realizes there's still water in there, jumps back out, crams himself into the radiator. I'm like, weird. Mm. And then I see Pixel doing the low cat. Mm Mm-hmm. Very, very cautiously sniffing his way, and he goes over to the radiator and crams himself under next to Widget. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? And I look in the bedroom, and there's a bird just doing laps above the bed. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm like, maybe I should just move. Like, maybe that, I should that just. That did it. Yeah, I'm like, you just take the keys and the wallet and leave, but I, I can't abandon the, the cats. How am oh. I going to get them? <laughs> I like, see. You meant you just didn't want to deal with the bird. I just didn't want to deal with the okay, bird. Okay, yeah. Um, so a neighbor and Twitter managed to like get me all the pieces I needed to get rid of the bird. Mm. So you tweeted, like, what do you do about a bird flying in your room? Right. And uh, I was like, guys, I have a bird in my apartment. What do I do? Mm. And, of course, everyone's like, Portlandia, put a bird on it. And I'm like, thanks, guys. But then uh. there's the one person who's helpful <laughs> who's like, it's daylight where you are. Mm-hmm. Turn the inside lights off. Open the window. The bird will fly towards the light. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but the bird... That's some MacGyver type shit right there. The bird wasn't the sharpest, so the neighbor had to help with a... um, Are we talking pigeon, hawk? like uh, Starling. Oh. Yeah. It's a cute bird. So then I figured out where the bird got in, Uh and I put a towel over the cubby hole and like thumbtacked it, so it was like covering, making a really great nesting space. Oh, okay. So then I had... Multiple birds. (laughs) Yeah. I had a whole lot of birds. Yeah. Um, And... You know, it was Red Hook a couple of years ago, so the landlord wasn't going to, like, fix anything because he's right. going to sell the building. They're going to mm-hmm. take it down. Um, Make it a Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> so there was just nothing to be done, and so I moved. Mm-hmm. Where'd you move? Uh, I don't want to oh, say that in public. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. That's fair enough. <laughs> still, still in Brooklyn. Oh, in Brooklyn? But the exact neighborhood, it's yeah. not a good idea. To, Secret. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Pro- protect yourself. Protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, but oh, as far as like defining pornography. Right. So the book club. So um, we read all these books that have to do with sex in mm-hmm. like a, a literature, like fiction kind of way. Um, and um, then every, every month I'm like, okay, was this porn? Mm. And we talk about whether we think it was porn or not. And sometimes it's a debate. Sometimes they're like, absolutely not. Sometimes mm. they're like, totally yes. Mm. Um, and what's most interesting to me is when we have these like, like where we're not sure. Mm-hmm. And so then we get to have a conversation about like the specifics of like, um, like Song of Songs in the Bible. We did that one month. Wow. Um, and, and it was a turn on, turns out. It's um, it's more. I'd I'd liken it more to like roomies, like mm. you know, like beautiful Sensual love poems. poems. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you're like, well, this isn't porn, but for the time that it was written, mm-hmm. it feels kind of racy, right? Like, and to have to have that work come out of Christianity. Mm. When we're, you know, we've grown up with today's Christianity, which I yeah. assume is kind of different. Um, it was, it was just interesting. Yeah. And then, of course, like one person's like, 
uh, brings up the eroticism of Jesus on the cross yeah. in the Catholic Church. Well, and just gore porn <laughs> of him getting hammered into the cross for, for another one. Yeah, and then yeah. my lawyer is like, I grew up with no sexy Jesus. Like, I grew up with Jesus, but he was, like, completely devoid of sexuality. So this is completely novel to me. <laughs> what, he had, his Jesus had a beer gut? Um, her, <laughs> but he was just very, like, chaste. <laughs> Oh, uh, really? <laughs> yeah. Not sexy Jesus? No. <laughs> That's not a fun kind of Jesus. I know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then Zero Spaces, we're creating all this content that's um, text, photo, and video mm. that seems like it's in the vein of pornography. Right. And then looking at how the audience res- responds to it to see, like... Where do, where do we think this gets categorized? So yeah. then eventually, in theory, I'll have this like pile of data points and be able to start going like, here are the things that are definitely porn. Here are the things that we're not sure are porn. What does this mean? Mm. Um, are you interested in trying to create like a more of a healthy like and realistic dialogue around all this stuff? Is that kind of like your mission? Like, yeah. be- to like for humans to accept that this is some form of human need because it exists and let's stop like sort of demonizing it and therefore making it even darker or bringing it bringing it more into the light and trying to sort of curating a healthier porn environment so um nina hartley do you know nina hartley is sounds familiar she started performing in the 80s Mm -hmm. um she's blonde she's curvy she's got big boobs she's really smart Mm -hmm. she um in the middle of her career did a number of educational videos and i think she might have been the first person to make educate like explicit sex ed videos Mm -hmm. um and her Her bachelor's degree was in nursing. And she says when someone is sick, they need a nurse. And our culture is sick around sex. Mm. So that's like what drives her. Mm. And Annie Sprinkle, also in the 80s and 90s, um, she would say the answer to bad porn isn't to get rid of porn. It's to make better porn. Mm. And I'm merely trying to continue that work. Right. Um, But... In order, in order to make good porn, all the infrastructure stuff comes into play. Right. So, like, I'm like, I just want to make some, like, beautiful stuff with people who have, like, a solid look, whatever that look is. Mm. You know, like, obviously, like, diversity of bodies is great, but, like, I like a strong something. Mm. Like, be curvy, be stocky, be fat, be skinny, just, like really like be, something yeah be full on yeah um <laughs> so so like, i just want to make like something beautiful with intense people having like connected intimate sexual interaction whatever that ends up looking like mm-hmm. um but then how are you going to put it online right who are you going to use to distribute your work how are you going to charge for your work oh the the payment processor options are very limited for s- people who show sex. Um, so we, you know, like the the coffee shop that I wish I'd stopped at on my way here. Mm-hmm. Um, they it's, <laughs> coming. It's, oh, coming. it's coming. It's coming. Okay. The order's in. They charge yeah. <laughs> maybe, they get charged maybe 3%, maybe 5% of a transaction fee. Um and porn, we have payment processors like CC Bill or Epic, <laughs> and I gouge you. yeah, we pay more like eleven to fifteen percent. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so and we we cannot accept PayPal. I mean, technically we could, but we would be risking losing that money because PayPal's made it very clear it's in their terms mm-hmm. of service. They don't want their yeah. service being used to process payments for sex work right. of any kind. Um, or you get into um, you get into the censorship of really visa. So um, each payment processor has these guidelines mm-hmm. for what kind of content you can show. And CC Bill, I um, I called them one year, and I was like, Hey, do you have like more specifics on this certain point? Um, 
because I want to make sure we stay on the right side of the line. And they sent me a longer document. And in that longer document, there was this line that was something about like, and anything else Visa might not like. Which is like hugely Everything. broad. <laughs> yeah, you're like, yeah. How, like, what does that even That's mean? It's carte blanche. Just, just I can't, carte blanche. Yeah. I haven't, yeah. I haven't managed to get anyone at Visa on Good the phone friend. who can help me. Um, but and you one never of, will. Yeah, one of the things that they really have a problem with is blood of any kind. Mm. So, um, you know, my my periods are less difficult in my 30s, um, like the like bleeding portion mm-hmm. and like shorter. But in my 20s, I sometimes I got my period three times a month mm. and it would be like like significant bleeding um, and trying to schedule porn scenes around that is this like just like scheduling nightmare because I'm like, <laughs> I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know mm. how long it's going to last. Um and it's it's such a problem because Visa won't allow you to show any blood. Oh, okay. And so I'm like, even if there's a little bit, yeah, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not trying to finger paint with the stuff. Right. It's just like you know, sometimes you're having sex and there's some blood, it and happens. it's normal, and it's just part of having mm-hmm. a body, right? right? Mm-hmm. Like it's just one of the things that happens when you have a body, mm-hmm. but we can't show it, right? Um, or. CC Bell is also very, um, they're very particular about thumbs. Uh-huh. You no can't thumbs? Put, thank you so much. Oh, you much. can't put thumbs in, in places? Yeah, you can't, um, <laughs> you can't have fingers and thumbs. And a thumb, because then it's fisting. Right, and the thing is, like, everybody who has no idea, they think fist, like, it sounds so violent, right? Like, mm. fisting, that thing's good. Um, thank it does you rather. so, thank you for <laughs> thank the coffee. You. Um... <laughs> So, like, fisting, if you've never experienced it or seen it, it sounds really violent. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's, like, super gentle and one of the Uh, most intimate. Meditative. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, like, slow, long insertion. Yeah, and you're, like, breathing together. (laughs) And, like, fully in tune with each other's bodies. And it's the only, because I don't have a penis, so it's the only way I can have a whole body part, like, inside someone, right? Right, yeah. Um. And so it's just the all of the infrastructure stuff then becomes this like sort of drag, yeah. and then then I'm like motivated to like try to navigate all of that. Yeah, um, but that's what motivated you to start writing, right? Like to to because you hated like the way journalists would write about all these things that you yeah. were involved in. So you, so in a way, it's been a gift for for you <laughs> and for all of us because you're a really good writer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, when I when I started doing porn, I started doing all these interviews. Right. I was a contract girl, and that's, like, most of the job. Um, and journalists would, like, they'd ask a question, like, um, you know, how, how disappointed are your parents? Nice. And I'm like, that, that's what you're starting with? That's where you're starting. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, do you do that to people who work at McDonald's? Do you like walk up to yeah. the counter and go, hey, how bummed are your parents that this yeah. is what you're doing with your life? No. I love um, the thing you wrote with uh, explaining what you do to your grandmother. That was great. Uh, what oh, a nudie girl. So you're a nudie, nudie girl. girl. <laughs> That's cute as hell, I dude. know. It's adorable. It's adorable. <laughs> and I, when I read that piece, yeah. people love it. Obviously, like the funny voice is a... a good laugh button mm-hmm. um, and the way it ends is great <laughs> i mean I, the image of your grandma with, anyway three boyfriends two yeah. boyfriends two boyfriends yeah uh, yeah my dad my dad's heard me read the piece and mm-hmm. he's like you you don't even get the full like you don't get the full impression of her voice right like i I can't reach that level of expressiveness. Where that she is she has. from? Where does the voice come from? Is um, it- she grew up in a little group of Serbian immigrants in uh, oh. near Pittsburgh. Interesting. Oh yeah. yeah, you did you grow up in Pittsburgh? No, I grew up in North Carolina. Oh okay. Yeah. It's a Serbian, and you just did a Serbian film too, right? A couple of years ago, yeah, that's, science fiction film. That's wild. Can I brag for a minute? Fuck, yeah, that's what you're here to do. We, I mean, you gave me this, so yes. They premiered They premiered the film. It's, Take called, a it's called AI Rising. Uh-huh, they yeah. premiered it at this film festival in Belgrade called Fest. Uh-huh. The theater holds, I think, four and a half thousand people. Wow. 
And so I walk in for the premiere and like, you know, we've like done the red carpet and uh-huh. they're like trying to hustle us to our seats so they can get started because we got a schedule to keep to. And I'm like, hold everything because the room is full and I'm like, stop everything. I have to take a picture for my mother. Right. And I take the picture and we like move on with our lives. And a few days later, they're like, um, just a heads up, you're winning best actress. Wow. And I'm like, but, but uh, it. <laughs> right. So I was really glad I got the warning so I could like write a speech and like not be a total spaz. During the movie, right. During the movie were you writing a speech? Um, no, this was, this was a few days later. Oh, okay. So they did like the whole festival. Oh, I see. I see. And they had like the closing ceremony. Um, yeah. So I, I did a movie and I did well enough that I was awarded for my performance. I'm yeah. super proud of myself. Yeah. Because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Yeah. And it's like, I haven't seen the film, but it's like a science fiction kind mm-hmm. of thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's science fiction, but it's more of a space opera. Oh, okay. So people who are, um, for instance, the uh, the Belgrade Programmers Club, who I'm friends with, they came to the premiere. They're a bunch of computer nerds, and they were like, "It was beautiful. All the science is wrong." <laughs> like, so you want to like I'm warn a nerd. people? <laughs> like, <if laughs> science you, wrong. <laughs> if you know Linux, you're gonna have a hard time suspending your disbelief. <laughs> but it's this. Luckily, like, there's not that many people that know that shit. <laughs> or DOS. I know DOS. <laughs> When I was a kid, we had the Berenstain Bears learn how to read program, and I had to navigate DOS to use it. <laughs> That's what I learned in high school is DOS. <laughs> did you read that piece to your grandmother, Nudie Girl? I didn't read it to her. I probably should at some point, but I... She'd probably get a kick out I've of it. I've told her about it, uh-huh. and I've told her about how audiences respond to it. Yeah. Um, That's cute. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just yeah. ask one question? Because no. we moved away from it, but uh-huh. about the payment thing, it's it's blown my mind a little bit. And two aspects of it. One is if the pornography industry is as big as we all know it is, how is no other company come up and agree to take? Somebody's making collecting that money. Is is everyone having that hard of a time? Um. And. Two is the visa thing. How does that apply to like um, Hollywood and movies that have blood in them? So they don't have sex. Some, you know. But you don't have sex and blood. It's got to be the combo. Yeah. That's, that they won't accept. That's where they have the problem is sex and blood together. Um, so like, for instance, Joanna Angel with Burning Angel is able to do like repenetrator and like her like horror porno stuff by being very careful about the where the blood is and where the porn is. Yeah. Um, so everyone's playing a game. Yeah. And, you you know, you like – because they won't give us a clear line, you sometimes take a risk and like, you know, worst case scenario, they suspend your billing. Um, but probably they're just going to ask you to take the problematic clip down. Um, so like sometimes you like stretch and like overstep a little bit and that's part of it because they won't give us a solid guideline. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Forbes, Forbes years and years ago printed that statistic about porn being like a billion dollar industry. And then they printed a retraction. And almost none of these companies are publicly traded. So they have no obligation to release books. You mean the distributors? Um, the distributors, the production studios, and like really, frankly, it's a lot of. Um, at, at this point, we have Mind Geek, formerly called Manwin. Take a second with that name. Manwin. Manwin. <laughs> Manwin. <weird>. Company <laughs> called Manwin comes into the valley, buys the company you're under contract to. How happy are you? <laughs> like. Um, but there's, there's MindGeek, formerly known as Manwin, that owns Pornhub, Digital Playground, Brazzers, Twisties, Men.com, I think the Mofos Network, all the like fake taxi, fake school, like whatever, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Then there's Gamma, and I don't think they – Gamma slash Mile High – and I don't think they have anything to do with tube sites, but they have adult time. They have um, – I'm not sure if they still have Sweetheart Video, but they did at one point. They have um, – I believe they purchased Burning Angel recently. Um, 
and like a whole bunch of other properties. Um, I think they handle evilangels.com. Um, and then you have the Vixen Network, which involves porn, tube, um, tushy, blacked.com, which is inherently racist, but we can move on. Um, <laughs> and deeper.com. Um, so you have these like entities where it's distributor, producer, and tube site all in one, um, all in one like entity. And, they're not very forthcoming about how they make these things work. Um, you know, MindGeek, they were the main thrust of the tube sites. Then as the production companies were devalued, they started buying them up. And now I have no idea how they make money because so much of the advertising on Pornhub is for sites that MindGeek owns. So they're not actually like bringing in, you know, and so I'm just like looking at like scratching my head going, this is so weird. But like also like journalists have looked into it and then like been foiled and not been able to like get anything useful to like understand what's happening over there. Um, so I have, I have no idea. Yeah. You know what another great piece of writing you did was the one uh, equating the ballerinas with a uh, condom law? That was brilliant. Emma Livery. What is it? Is it Emma the... Livery was her name. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great piece. Thank you. What well, did you like about it? Well, for one, I learned that ballerinas caught on fire. You know, like that's I did... gnarly. That's gnarly. Like yeah. yeah, so I I mean, are you can you read anything here for us or I or don't not have my book with me. I didn't ask yeah. her to bring it. My fault. Yeah. Um, philosophy, porn, and pussycats. Is that the philosophy, p- pussycats, and porn? Oh, philosophy, pussycats, um, and porn. She wrote a book of essays, and I wonder. Yeah. I think I might be able to find that piece, though. It's a great piece. I found it. Okay, good. Yeah, this is good. I went to Blue Stockings in Manhattan recently and left with a stack of books. One of the books was Deirdre Kelly's Ballerina, Sex, Scandal, and Suffering Behind the Symbol of Perfection. It starts out exactly as salacious as the title implies and ends with a discussion of modern steps towards better workers' rights and healthier job conditions. Somewhere in the middle is a relatively extensive retelling of, Evan, of Emma Livery's story. I was prepubescent and enrolled in a significant amount of ballet classes when I first heard of Emma Livery. She was so fantastically talented that the great Marie Taglioni herself was moved to choreograph Le Papillon for Livry to dance the starring role in. After performing the role of Farfalla the Butterfly, in which the burning of her wings serves as the catalyst for the happy ending, Livry herself was actually burnt when her costume was set alight by the open flames of stage lighting during a rehearsal for the opera The Mute Girl of Portizzi. Then she died. Because it was the 19th century and antibiotics hadn't been invented yet, which is definitely an ending, but difficult to classify as a happy one. I'm unsure about the intent of the instructor who told me this anecdote. It could have been an attempt to instill gratitude for modern medical science, or a desire to impart knowledge of a notable moment in the history of dance. My initial takeaway was that Emma Livery, the last major dancer of the Romantic era, died in the most romantic with a capital R way imaginable. Don't act like Byron and his peers weren't the poster children for opulent morbidity. I had no idea, until midway through reading Kelly's Ballerina, that the French government had introduced legislation years before Livery's accident, which required costumes to be treated with flame-retardant chemicals. I also had no idea that a number of dancers had refused to wear the treated tutus because the chemicals made their skirts dingy and stiff spoiling the ethereal effects they went through years of punishing physical training to achieve. Livery, despite having witnessed the narrowly averted death by burning of one of her co-workers, was one of the dancers who wrote letters to the Paris Opera protesting the flame-resistant costumes. I insist, sir, on dancing all first performances of the ballet in my ordinary ballet skirt, and I take it upon myself all responsibility for anything that may occur, she writes. After being set on fire by a stage light, experiencing burns on more than a third of her body, and suffering through treatments in which lemon juice was squeezed into her wounds, someone asked Livery if her opinions on flame-retardant chemicals had changed. 
She acknowledged the increased safety, but maintained that she still would not wear them if she were ever able to return to work. Dancing in a stage production, like performing in an adult film, feels like a combination of practicing the craft of performance and acting as a tool for the fulfillment of the director's vision. The most likely negative ramifications of dancing are things like chronic snap-crackle popping of joints at a young age and maybe a fractured or broken bone here and there. The likely negative ramifications of performing in adult entertainment are things like ostracization by family, peers, or society at large, and difficulty securing other employment later in life. Both careers tend to have an upper age limit, typically under 35. Risks are taken and sacrifices are made for a chance at success. That success is a slim possibility, and even if it is achieved, it lasts for a very short window of time. To enter either profession is to accept the likelihood of certain harmful side effects and the risk of more serious damage. The sacrifices I've made for my work were willing, but they were sacrifices nonetheless, and I would appreciate the freedom to continue to evaluate which risks I feel are worth taking and which safety measures I deem best to employ in each individual situation. While I was reading Ballerina, I was spending most of my work hours attempting to hunt down a currently working adult performer who was pro-AB1576 and willing to give me an interview regarding why. California's AB1576 bill is the latest in a string of county and state legislation geared towards forcing adult performers to use condoms and sex scenes as a prophylactic, in spite of mountains of statements from performers saying that what they want is the ability to choose for themselves which safety measures to use. I never did find a performer who agrees with AB1576, much less one willing to discuss it on public record. I was struck by the similarities between the responses of the Paris opera dancers and the reactions of California-based adult performers to outside legislation. I thought that I should probably be reacting to these new pieces of Emma Livery's story by taking them as a warning. But I wasn't reacting that way, and my opinion on forced barrier use at work didn't change. I just admired Emma's dedication to her work. I'm definitely not arguing for a dedicated pornography wing in the Louvre, but I would absolutely argue that adult videos are a kind of low art. They are, after all, generally protected in the United States under the First Amendment. Pornography has undeniable mass appeal and speaks to one of the most basic human needs. While it frequently caters to the lowest common denominator in an effort to be financially viable, It does occasionally produce timeless works. Consider Betty Page, who appeared in pictures which were classified as pornographic at the time and are now deemed suitable for travel mugs and refrigerator magnets. Like Emma Livery's distaste for stiff skirts spoiling her illusion of weightlessness, I dislike the idea of being forced to use barrier protection when the accompanying friction impedes my ability to deliver the best performance possible. If members of the French government had listened to the dancers they were trying to protect, they could have explored options like moving the lights two feet forward or enclosing them in cages. Maybe the real lesson here is that performers and artists will do their work in the ways they consider best, and harm reduction can only be effective when their requirements are considered first. Fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Wait, what do I do with my... Oh, there it is. What, um... My coffee. Who who inspires you writing? Your like who are some of your favorite writers? Um, mm, I that's such a difficult question. I am um, I really like reading nice social justice oriented sci fi and fantasy. Mm-hmm. So like Anne McCaffrey, Terry Pratchett, Mercedes Lackey, um, Jacqueline Carey, um, and that kind of writing has very little to do with the kind of writing that I do. Right. Like I, I like my op-eds to be like fact, fact, point, fact, point. Um, right. And I, I've, I've been told that sometimes I'm almost like beating people over the head with it. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's strong. It's very, it's uh, brisk. <laughs> yeah, it is brisk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the kind of... Never the mind kind the of... poetry, just get to the facts. <laughs> yeah. That's what Jack Kerouac says. A bit. Yeah. Um, like there's, you know, there's so much romanticism around pornography, for better or worse, that I don't feel like we really need to like 
you know, experience being on set with like the golden tan color of my coworkers. Like someone can Google what they look like, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, Right. It's more it's more about like the the feelings and what's going on and the like systems at play that are underneath what's happening. Um, Whereas like the kind of stuff I like to read is very like. It's a it's a nice pleasant journey, and yeah. you're like there for the sentences as much as the story. Right. Um, but my my I I guess explaining work, if that makes sense. Um, the most of the writing is definitely in that category, but also like like this interview talking about payment processors. Um, like that kind of thing the the inspiration for that comes from the women who've come before Nina Hartley Annie Sprinkle Candida Royale mm-hmm. um you know the the work that they began in the 20th century is still so necessary yeah um, and that's that's where my like motivation comes from a form of activism a bit yeah i'm like slowly coming to terms with the label like at first it was like oh, no, i'm just you know i'm just trying to deal with stuff that's in the way of me making pretty porno mm-hmm. like don't don't try to put the a word on me mm. um i like started to come around to it what's your process writing wise do you do it sort of daily in the mornings what it, you know, it, is it, it regular uh, uh, uh it depends on what i'm working on so like philosophy pussycats i would get this like feeling of like this thing has to be expressed in a public statement online um like i like have to write about this thing that happened and like how that relates to this thing that's happening in society or like i have to i have to express this difficulty i'm having as a pornographer because of some kind of censorship or like whatever was happening Mm -hmm. like i would sit because i had to and i would get it out and i would feel like ah relief and like move on Mm um the the slate column whenever i get my questions and ha- like the next as soon as i get my questions the next time i have an hour and a half i sit down and i do them right um and something like the ballerina piece do you have that idea like oh i can correlate uh those two things or did it come with the writing and <sighs> so there's in my life, there's before ADHD medication oh, okay. and after ADHD medication. And um, before, I I had such a hard time thinking in a straight line. Uh-huh. But sometimes it would be like, um, you know, like the eye doctor when they like switch the lenses in front of you and they're like, how about yeah. this? Which one's better? A or B? A or B? Mm-hmm. A or B? Um, it would be like... When you get the right lens and like all of a sudden it's just like, so I was, I was reading this ballerina book and AB 1576 and the fight against it was something that I was involved with to a certain degree. And all of a sudden I saw the overlap and was just like, oh God. And then you get the feeling of like, I have to sit and write this down before my brain loses its grip on this. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Doing the slate column, it's um, it's definitely better to be on the stimulant medication because um, it's it's a different kind of work. Right. It's less expression and more um, reflection of what the writer is saying, mm-hmm. the person who's writing in for advice. Um, but on the stimulant medication, I don't get those leaps of logic that I used to. Interesting. So it's a trade-off. So it thwarts you in some areas and helps you in others. Yeah. Yeah. The- but I don't night owl anymore. Like I like go to sleep at a reasonable time. Which is interesting because it's amphetamines. Right. <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's not been you, my experience. That's how I you know I have ADD. Is yeah. Because you give me the stimulant yeah. medication. I can sit still. I go to sleep at a normal time. Yeah. When I've tried that, then it's like, well, I'll just take one more. Okay. One more. Two days later, I'm still not asleep. You know, it's just like I got that addictive personality. Oh, no. Yeah. It's, oh. a, it's a burden. <laughs> You know? <laughs> it is a so I had, what was uh growing up in north carolina like that's like pretty much the so you're a southern girl oh god um you don't want to go there <laughs> i had i had one grandma 
her two kids were male. Mm -hmm. So she really like she had like decades of dress up urges that were unrequited until I came along. Mm. Um, so there were a lot of really frilly dresses in my childhood, uh -huh. which my mom was not a fan of. Right. Um, so there was this like grandma mom tension where moms like be a human and grandma's like girly stuff and mom's like grumble, grumble, girly stuff. Interesting. Um, and I was homeschooled. Oh, really? I was so mostly homeschooled. <laughs> so your mom was like more like, no, don't dress her up in frilly dresses. I want her to be like a fierce warrior. Well, she was, she, um, this is actually not uncommon for the children of second wave feminists. Um, so she was a certain kind of feminist and she, she went into the military, she went into STEM fields, um, and she had this like kind of like idealistic boomer idea of the world that her child was going to grow up in. Mm -hmm. And she wanted me to know that I could be anything I wanted to be. Mm. And then I decided I wanted to be a porn star, and she regretted that a little bit. <laughs> did she? Yeah. yeah. Did she? It, did you get ostracized, or were there, was there acceptance? It was. Um, she didn't ostracize me, but she would make these comments, like it would be like, "And what did you do today? Right. Try to find fake eyelashes that match your pubic hair." <laughs> and like, really. <laughs> And Ouch. it's like, wow, Mom, burn. Damn, Mom. Like, you, like re you really hate the falsies, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> like, tell me about your feelings on mascara then. And why, does, <laughs> why do they have to match, really? I, don't, yeah. I think it's cool if they don't. I think it's interesting. <laughs> it's like better even <laughs> so she would like she would like make these like nasty barbs as a way of like venting yeah. her disappointment um and then you know years go by i have two op-eds in the new york times i've written a book like yeah. all that and she's very proud of that she just still doesn't quite seem to understand that it's very unlikely any of that would have been possible had i not done the mainstream porn part right with the fake eyelashes and the lip gloss and the like on and on well it's informed your writing work a yeah lot, to a large degree i mean yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't be the writer i am without all of that lived experience yeah. um so mostly i just try to like steer the conversation towards safe topics with her yeah um but yeah north carolina was and homeschooled awkward. mm mm-hmm yeah, that's like coming from the feminist, probably mom not wanting you to be like sort of mm -mm. Uh, programmed in the school system. No, apparently, and both of my parents swear up and down this is how it happened. I came home at six years old and was like homeschooling. We should do this, right? And they were like, "Why?" And in like six-year-old talk, I was like, "Well, some of the other kids don't read so good. Yeah, they need more time." I don't get to read really at all. I'm not learning. This sucks. Right. Um, so they they looked into it and they decided it was actually reasonable. Um, so we did that for most of my childhood. But like every couple of years, we would try another kind of school and see if like maybe, maybe work. this format or maybe that format. No, because the longer I was homeschooled, the more... <laughs> Like the more like strange you and got. like yeah. yeah, I know it's hard to go back into the box. Oh God! Do you, do you have any siblings? Mm -mm. No, no, it's just me. Just you. Yeah. Huh. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. And how long? When did you move? Did you go to college or? We moved to Delaware when I was like eleven, maybe, um, and then. Then when I was 16, I sort of slowly started moving up to Philadelphia because oh, okay. by that point, um, I'd gotten a, there was a, it was, it's like actually an accredited high school, but you can attend through the mail. So I had like a real high school diploma oh, okay. before I turned 16. Um, cause when you're, you know, they like send you the courses and if you're real hot to get your diploma and like go out in the world, then you can just work your ass off and get it done mm -hmm. in a year. Um, so, so I did that. <laughs> and I sort of like slowly moved up to Philadelphia. 
And then it was... Um, Why Philadelphia? Because it was close and I yeah. wasn't 18. Right. And like, you know, you, you go to your mom and you're like, I want to move out. Right. To a big city. Like, and you're not 18. <laughs> There's a compromise that's got to happen. Where do you get that sort of bravery and independence? Mm. Where did it come from? I want to be flippant, but I don't want to contribute to low-key racism. So I'll explain what I almost said and why I didn't say it. Love it. So what I wanted to do <laughs> was be like, well, yes, I'm Serbsky. Like, I'm, I'm a quarter Serbian. Serbian women are made of steel. Oh, okay. um, but really, I think I think every culture can look at every gender role that that culture has space for and go, oh, like, the men are strong because of this, the women are strong because of this, mm -hmm. the the non-binary or trans people are strong because of um and i think i think um espe especially when you're talking about a region like the balkans it's really important to stay wary for flashes of nationalism mm. um <laughs> so that's the whole the thing that i was like maybe i shouldn't say that in right. the explanation um yeah, I don't, I don't know. Which, pa I mean, your parents, they must have, or your mom, I guess you explained that. She's got a, f a fire to her. She's got a fire. She's very independent. Yeah. Um, she's, she's fierce. Yeah. When she decides that something is right or wrong and decides to do something about that, she's like, like, she's like digs her teeth in and locks her jaws. Mm. Um, and she was, yeah, she went off on her own like right after high school and traveled the country and had a whole life okay. and did the army and yeah and were you writing already when you were a kid in philly or uh, i had you know i had like a journal mm -hmm. and then um there was this website god's girls that mm. sprung up as a competitor to suicide girls because suicide okay. girls had such strict and controlling business practices towards the models okay um so someone was like, I'm going to build like Suicide Girls, but without being a control freak about it. Um, it's, it's not very, it has like 300 members now. Um, what, God's Girls? <laughs> yeah, it had it had definite buzz in like the mid 2000s. And now it's like, um, but they had the they had the same blogging and personality component. Okay. So you're like nude in these photo sets, but, but then, then your you're personality. also yeah. So people can totally fall in love with you, right? So <laughs> in I would, every way, yeah. So you know, you had the blog, and you like yeah. post like dumb stuff on the blog, right. and then slowly I was like, oh, I guess I should maybe like when I moved to Tumblr, I was like, maybe I should like look into capitalization and like more punctuation than periods and commas, right. um, yeah. and like slowly like. Started taking it more seriously. So you became a God's girl and started blogging. Um, yeah, Is that right? so yeah. It's kind of like that was the en entrance into sort of what's culminated now to a degree, right? A bit. Um, there was also this other company called Razor Dolls mm -hmm. that was the same but more hardcore. Oh, okay. Um, and there, who I did my first sex scene with. Okay. Um, it was a woman named Jade Star. I want to say. Um, Jade something. Let's call her Jade Star. Yeah. I'm into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but those those two, the like that weird alt porn moment. Um, okay, so it was alt porn, mm -hmm. sort of like. And what what was the decision when like the God's Girl thing? Like, what was the first like? Okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna become a nudie girl. <laughs> like, you know. So. Like, I'd been go go dancing the night before. Oh, so you you started dancing at a club? Yeah, just oh, okay. like you know, you like go to the club, and then the promoters like, "Do you want to get paid a hundred bucks to dance on the podium where it's safe?" And you're like, "Actually, yeah." <laughs> oh, okay. So, so they're just like dancing in a club, um, and I was sitting on the couch. I woke up on the couch the next morning because my room was downstairs and it was a death trap if you were drunk. Mm -hmm. And so I would sleep on the couch half the time if I came home drunk. Mm -hmm. I wake up and my roommate Johnny is standing there and he's like, hey, you don't mind being naked. And I'm wearing panties and band-aids over my nipples mm -hmm. and a pair of fishnet stockings pretending that they're a shirt. And I'm mm -hmm. like, nope. And he's like, <laughs> he explains, he's like, there are these websites 
couple of competitors to Suicide Girls have sprung up. You've mentioned being possibly interested in Suicide Girls in the past. They want me to find my own models. What do you think? And I'm like, well, my one concern is like, you know, that's the internet. Mm -hmm. So. It's forever. Yeah. Like I can like do like a weird performance art moment and have it be weird and like not work and then just like you know a couple weeks later no one remembers Mm -hmm. but nude pictures you put them on the internet that's it Mm -hmm. (laughs) like everyone can see your vagina for the rest of your life um so i was like okay let's like walk through this and we're like all right let's imagine my dad saying so honey you're doing porn. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. imagine, imagine like all these like scenarios going poorly. Like, mm. does this feel navigable? And then, um, then I was like, but you know, like I'm really impulsive, so this seems like a good idea. But what if like two weeks from now I wake up in the middle of the night, like, oh my god, what have I done? And he's like, mm. well, we shoot the pictures, we sit on the pictures. After a couple of months, we see how you feel. Smart guy. Yeah. Wow. And I'm like, brilliant. And we were very close, so I trusted him. Yeah. I have a feeling um, he didn't do that. Yeah. No, no, no. We, t- we took the pictures. He sat on the pictures. Like, eight weeks later, I was like, hey, let's release those. And he's like, are you sure? Let's wait a little bit longer. <laughs> like, Why did he want to wait? Um, Because he didn't. He's he's just a really good guy. Hmm. Like, his first. Um, Is he successful now? He's uh he never he never wanted to do photography professionally really. Oh, okay. Um he's like a radiologist or something oh, okay. now. Um he works in the medical profession. Right. In his first gallery show, he had four pieces in this group show. Uh-huh. He sold one. It was a picture of me. He came to me with twenty five dollars. He's yeah. like I'm like, What is this? He's like, It's your cut. He explains and I'm like, Johnny, how much did framing and printing cost? Yeah. And he's like, oh, like 50 bucks. And I'm like, yes, you made nothing. Right. So this is yours. Right. <laughs> like, but like he was that kind of person. Right. It Interesting. Would be like, yeah. So an angel ushered you into the porn industry. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. You should write a piece, The Angel That Ushered Me Into Porn. <laughs> so what was it like uh, shooting your first sex scene? Was that heady? Or were you just, was, was what was that like? So I was very like I was talking to the Razor Dolls people over email and I'm like, look, I don't know I don't know how I'm gonna feel about this when I show up. I might have a panic attack during makeup. Mm-hmm. Like they might be working on my face and I might go, I can't I can't do this. So that has to be okay with you. And if you get if you get five minutes of footage and then I'm like, I can't do this, you can keep your five minutes, but I'm gonna put my clothes on and leave. Mm-hmm. Um and they were like totally okay with that. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I get on the plane and we're doing the sex scene. Where'd and you it's, go? Um, LA. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was living in Philly and I went out to LA. And we're doing the sex scene. Van Nuys? Is that? No, we were at the Chateau Marmont. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Right at the top of the world. Yeah. <laughs> First time out of the gate. <laughs> and I'm in, I'm in roller skates. <laughs> and I'm like pressed up against the wall, back arched. She's eating me out. And the director goes, oh, and we're like, what? And he was like contorting himself to get the best angle and pulled his back. Oh. So we had to stop the scene. So <laughs> they have like a 12 minute scene, but it wasn't me. It was the director's like slip disc or something. Right. Um, yeah. And it was after that, I was like, I don't, I don't think I want to work with people I haven't met. It's really hard to tell if you want to have sex with someone from a picture. Mm-hmm. Like, they can be beautiful. Right. There's so many beautiful people in the world that I have no interest in fucking. Right. And plenty of people who are, like, not conventionally attractive or don't photograph well, but there's just something about them, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so after that, I was like, I can't, I can't do scenes unless I meet the people first. And living on the East Coast, how was I going to meet these people? So I didn't do very much until Digital Playground was like Sophia Santi. And I'm like, Sophia Santi's gorgeous. Mm. And then once they had me in the office, they were like, "Um, how do you feel about boys? And I actually never got to do a scene with Sophia Santi, really. We were in a couple of orgies together, but that's not the same. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. So where – so 
So then you started shooting porn on the East Coast? No, no. Oh. It was Digital Playground was in Los Angeles. Oh, so you um, went out there. I ended up moving out there for a while. Oh, okay. Um, and they, the first couple of scenes, I had to trust the director's judgment because um, I hadn't met anyone. But then after that, you know, you meet people on set, you meet people at conventions. So I was able to put together like a – a yes list. Mm -hmm. It's standard practice for a performer to have a no list, a list of people they won't work with. Mm -hmm. But um, I had the privilege, I think it was because I was a contract performer, to say, here's my yes list. Here's who I want to work with. Mm -hmm. And as a director and producer now, I think everyone should have a yes list. I'm only interested in people's yes lists. Mm -hmm. Like I – go to one performer and I'm like, who do you – like, here's my vision. Do you see yourself in this? Okay, great. Who do you want to be with you? And then I go to those people and I'm like, here's my vision. Here's the person. Like, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And I only want to book what people are excited about. Right. Yeah. So – and I heard you also describe performing in porn as like kind of almost an athletic dance type of situation. It's you put a, it differently than that, but it's a um, you know, I I come from a heavy dance background. Mm -hmm. I never I never made it to professional leagues at all, but I I did tons of dance training, and of course, you know the like school shows. Um, and I approach pornography as a physical performance, mm -hmm. um, not so much like sports. But it is like like I like warm up first. Mm -hmm. How um, do you do that? Just the normal, you know, like shoulder yoga? shrugs, you do like yoga? little. Um, no, I don't do yoga. You don't. I've taken a little bit of Pilates. Um, you should do a little like hip, hip, hip flexor openers. beats. Yeah, then do 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 do. Oh, okay. Do. <laughs> Stretch out a bit. Um, that's all that kind of stuff. Do you meditate? Um, I actually on AI Rising, the actor I was working with. He, um, this was before the ADHD medication. Mm -hmm. um, so he noticed that I was having a really hard time with distractions. And he, um, he had to teach me a couple of, it was like two karate kicks and an Aikido throw. Um, and we ended up not using that scene. But he was like preparing to teach me that. And I sat, I was like, all right, I need a second. I sat on the floor, closed my eyes, took stock of my body. And was like, okay, now I'm ready. And he's like, hold on. What did you just do there? And I explained. And he's like, okay, you can do that with anything. And I'm like, what? And he's like, close your eyes. What do you hear? And I'm like, there's this like buzzing noise. And he's like, where's it coming from? And I'm like, top left, like here. And he's like, what is it? And I'm like, it's the air conditioner or the heater. And he's like, yes, let it go. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, if I just take a second to go, what is that? Oh, this is what this is. Now I can ignore it. Mm -mm. Then, like, that's so much brain space freed up. Mm. Um, and it was it was really helpful for me. And then I was able to take that and apply it to, like, my inner world. Mm. And go, like, okay, we can, like, close our eyes and be like, oh, this thing that we're stressed about. Is there anything to be done? Nope. Right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Like on to the next thing. Sort of like metacognition. I guess. Which is just like up leveling your sort of like you're where you're putting your identity. Like if I'm upset, asking who's upset, who's asking who, who's upset. Okay. You know, becoming the witness of yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And then just being yeah. in the moment. Just yeah. Being in consciousness. Yeah. 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 Like how much is that aspect important in in pornography like being in the moment being actually present that's oof so there there are two styles of performing mm -hmm. there's the technical way where the the performer in question will deliver a solid scene every time no matter what the conditions are like they're going to make it work and um it it may or may not be authentic, but you're going to get the same performance no matter what. Mm -hmm. As a producer, 
you love that kind of performer. Mm -hmm. Um, The other kind of performer, which is what I am, which is, of course, like a hothouse flower and like more difficult Mm -hmm. is. Got to be feeling it. Got to be feeling it. Got to be feeling it. Got to be feeling the person. Got to be feeling the scenario. Got to be feeling the wardrobe. Because I'm also like really sensitive to costume changes. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I, I, I use that in my day to day life. Like I'm like, oh, I'm going to a thing and I need to be like this. So I'm going to wear this because it makes me feel this way and it'll be great. Um, Mm. So like even even down to what panties I'm wearing has to like make sense. Um, And then. I go into my body and take a minute and go like, hey, body, how are we feeling today? Does anything hurt? Like, okay, brain, is anything in the way? Um, you know, let's like sort through and like like have a clear head. And then you're just there with mm, – you're simultaneously just there with the person mm-hmm. in this little bubble and tracking – Where's the camera? Where's my light? Is my hair in my face? Um, mm. And it's this like duality. It's this duality that I also experience with narrative acting. Mm. Um, so ballet, you rehearse it until your body just knows it, right? And you're performing, and you're not thinking about anything, and your body knows what step is after what step, and like at most, your brain is going like point flex up Mm -hmm. relax um but it's just these like high points Mm -hmm. um but porn and narrative acting narrative acting it's more like the the removed part is giving me my lines um like knowing like (laughs) what i'm supposed to say or like watching for my keyword from the other person Mm -hmm. but there is a similar duality where it's like i'm here i'm in this moment i'm reacting but also there is this part that's like not here at all and is with the script or with is my hair in my face Mm. yeah do you ever have any issues like with your mind beating you up during the scene like uh like because i'm just equating it with being i'm a musician i perform and sing and stuff like that sometimes my mind will be like you suck dude (laughs) like you know like (laughs) bro this song sucks and and i'll just be like no you know, like, I just have to, like, have a conversation going on. I'm like, no, man, you can't do this right now because I'm, like, in front of people doing this, you know? Like, um, do you have any internal conversations like that? I So I have I have a lot of things that are, like, like pre-process kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I will not look in the mirror. Right. Unless it's to approve makeup, and then I'm not going to look for very long. Right. Because I don't. I don't want to see my flaws right before I go in. You have flaws? I do have flaws. I don't know. know. Every single person in the world has things that nobody else can see that drive them up a wall. Um, Except for me, everyone can see mine. (laughs) I'm convinced. (laughs) Um, So there are like things like that. And then every once in a while, like um, there's one scene... One scene, it was on a high production, like, couples-oriented feature. Lots of dialogue. Lots of lights. And we go in to shoot the male-female sex scene. Mm -hmm. And um, first, there's a problem with the camera. And then the sun's moved. So we got to relight to match the first stuff. And then the camera goes down again. And then the sun's moved so much that nothing's going to match. So we got to start over from scratch. Mm. And then, then I'm starting to get like tense and like, you know, wondering if it's me and the sound guy, it's always the sound guy, the sound guy, the sound guy goes, it's not you, it's us. And I burst into tears. And so then they got to take me to makeup to get touched up (laughs) because he's like, it's not you, it's us. And I'm like, it is me. (laughs) And then we go back in and by that time they've had to like relight the whole thing because it's dark. Um, and that was that was rough and it took about eight hours uh-huh. to get wow, it. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So like Yeah, like so that so you're probably forced to like just be in a sexual situation for extremely long periods of time, I guess. Um, you know, that's that particular scene is like a major outlier. Right. And I mostly perform in my own productions now. Uh-huh. And there Are you still performing? 
Occasionally. Oh, okay. Um, and it, it's mostly for Zero Spaces. Um, Which is your own. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of the co-founders. Um, one of the co-founders. I have equity. I right. <laughs> built the whole thing. Well, Mitch built the website, but like, you know, we like built it from the ground up. Yeah. Um, so when I'm performing... It's usually for myself, and a lot of it is the, like, around the world in 80 ways stuff, where it's just, like, me and a camera and someone I want to have sex with who wants to have sex with me. And um, there's, like, there's one scene with Eric Everhard in Budapest where... Um, Eric we, Everhard? Yeah. Is it? <laughs> that's his name. And his penis is wedge-shaped. It's yeah. very unique. Um, really? Yeah. So in Budapest, what do you mean wedge-shaped? I mean, it's shaped like a wedge. A wedge? Yeah. Like a, it's like a little triangle cone of flesh. Tri- it's a triangle? It's great for anal. Right. Yeah, because it just like the tip's small, so it uh-huh. eases right in. <laughs> and then it looks huge. Right. Yeah. Um Camera has 25 pounds. I know. Um, So, Eric, we get like 20 minutes in and my watch beeps and I'm Uh like, okay, we've got enough footage. Um, And he's like, I'm not done having sex with you yet. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then there's a whole other like 20 minutes of the two of us fucking like not paying attention to the camera at all. Right. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Which I... Did you I use really that part it. too? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We released um an an uncut version. Yeah. Where you see like everything. Right. Um, yeah. And that's around the world in eighty ways. Is that mm-hmm. is that like a continuing series you do? Mm-hmm. Yep. We've done um we've done Paris and London and Barcelona and Mexico City and Amsterdam. Um yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with Napoleon Hill, Mm-mm. Think and Grow Rich? Mm-mm. And he's got a whole chapter on sexual transmutation. Are you familiar with sexual transmutation? Is this like a sex magic, like harnessing sexual energy for harnessing, other... Yeah, harnessing sexual energy to uh, achieve greatness is the idea. I was reading this Barbara Corrales book, uh-huh. Urban Tantra. Oh, okay. And um, she talks about... It's it's like it's like sexual meditation basically. Yeah, tantra. I'm, I'm reading along and I'm like, "Oh my god, yeah. that thing I do when I get stuck on a column question, I've been doing weird sex magic with no clue I was doing it." Oh, really? Like <laughs> yeah. what? So, I'll like get stuck on a question and I won't know what to do. And I'll go upstairs and I'll lay in bed and like fully connect with the mattress. And breathe all the way into my pelvic floor and mm-hmm. just like feel my body and mm-hmm. try to be open to an answer from the universe mm-hmm. of like what direction or like what I need to like That's meditation, research. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm like reading this book and it was like a few months ago and I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> um, I'm sort of I'm sort of excited what I can do with it intentionally. So you're are, are you masturbating while you're doing that? Or is it is, is sex have anything to do with it or is it straight up meditation? It's uh um I would I feel I feel sort of like I don't know enough about meditation to really make a statement here, but if I had to I would say it's like a it's like a urethral sponge centered meditation. Urethral sponge centered. Yeah. Explain that. Like it's like like the focus is here. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, okay. Like right, like you know, around the pelvic bone. Um, and like when I'm breathing, like you know, they tell you to do like belly breathing, like breathe into your like pranayama <clears throat> breathing, like. I guess. I thought that was kundalini. Uh, I, oh well, it's a form. I guess yeah, kundalini uses that too. It's called a pranayana breathing in the yoga practice I go. Okay, to. well, there's like that like fire breath thing. Fire breath of but fire. But just like you know, just like at like a psychiatrist or whatever, they'll be like breathe into your belly, breathe into your solar plexus, mm-hmm. and I'm breathing all the way into my pelvic floor, mm. and like the the kegel muscles are right. involved. And so the um, an- okay, yeah, and yeah. the answers are coming from there, maybe sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if the answer like comes from my vagina like a crystal ball, but it, there's a there's like a clear headedness that then lets me take like a 
an angle that I wasn't previously seeing on the question. Yeah. Yeah. I've been exploring a lot of that stuff. Sexual transmutation, semen retention, stuff like that. No fap. <laughs> <laughs> What's your take on NoFap? I found the right person to say that to, Joe. I don't know. I was I was not going to bring it up. Right. But then I'm like thinking of Ralph. And he was like, he would be like, you didn't even ask her about sexual transmutation. Uh, right. I think, um, I think, I think sex positivity is largely great. Is that, are you considering NoFap sex positivity? Mm-mm, I'm getting there. Okay. So I think. I think sex positivity is largely great, but it can get like into the other ditch. Right? Okay. Everything can do that. Right, like, take care of yourself by pouring a leisurely bath with Lilo's rose petal bath salt Epsom salt things in it and What's then wrong with that? I love it then salt. light candles <laughs> and oil your skin and masturbate with this toy that's, that's gonna give you a golden orgasm um and like you know like oh like you know me and my husband have sex three times a week and it's wonderful well me and my husband have sex four times a week oh are we having enough sex because they're having sex four times a week and we're only having sex three times a week and we want to be sex positive or like um you know, like, I I feel like poly is a valid thing, so I want to participate in it, but I feel all these icky feelings, and I don't think it suits me. And it's like, well, then stop it. Mm-hmm. Like, sex positivity can become um, – I'm still not done rambling about it. One more quote. I uh, – I believe that pornography can be good. So in order to demonstrate that, I'm doing this thing that I'm uncomfortable with performing in a sex scene. And it's like none of that's necessary. Mm. Like you don't you don't have to be into kink to be sexually open mm. and interesting. You don't have to be into anal. You don't have to be kissing men if you don't want to kiss men. You don't have to be um, going out on dates that are lackluster because your partner has a secondary partner of their own like you you don't have to be performing polyamory you don't have to be performing sex positivity and i think sometimes taking a break from sex can be really good yeah it's helped me yeah it helped me out but like i said i have that addictive personality Mm -hmm. so for me it's like i tend to be extreme you know so and then i can uh i put i feel like i put all that energy when i can focus on that stuff like just i can put it all into like artwork and stuff Mm -hmm. like that it it sort of manifests into like this kind of thing or music and stuff like i i feel like i can transfer it into other realms sometimes my sexual appetite just stops Mm -hmm. and it correlates with how much work i have going on right so when it's when it's a two solo column week Plus the chat, plus I have a piece I have to write for someone else, mm-hmm. plus I have all the zero spaces stuff, plus we're like in active production. Mm-hmm. I'm like not interested in sex at all. Right. I'm not interested in flirting. Sometimes I'm like, how dare you look at me as a sexual creature when that is not the headspace I am in right now at all. <laughs> right. Um, and then, you know, like work like backs off and I'm back to hornball. What about, yeah, like, uh, well, that's the th- same thing with me in terms of when I, when I open those, when I open that door back again, then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you just want it more and more. Yeah. Because of the huge endorphin hit, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> just because sex is great. I don't know. That is great. Yeah, it is great. Oh. But, like, do you have uh, um, issues with, like, relationships rega- around your work? You must, right? Like, and are you currently in a relationship, or what's that like? I, uh, so right now I have a boyfriend and a girlfriend, and that's all I have time for. Um, I, the biggest problem is my schedule. Mm-hmm. So for the first 10 years of my career, like, you know, like, traveling all the time you go to set to do a two-day wonder that's what they call the like like featurettes where it's like you know it's got like two stars some filler performers um some Mm up-and-comers there's a plot it's four or five scenes but it's like bare bones and it takes two days but those are very long days we don't have a union Mm. 
our crew isn't part of the the crew unions um so at least when i was doing that kind of work it was totally normal to show up on set at 6 30 7 o'clock in the morning and be leaving at 1 a.m mm. and then report back at like eight or nine um for another very long day mm. so oh shit how'd i get on that well, because I asked you about relationships right. and schedule. if it gets in the way. And schedule. Yeah, you were talking about schedule, but I was talking yeah. more about like, don't they get bummed out if you're sleeping with other people, even if it's for work? Or is that, I mean, I know that's kind of a cliche question. Every, yeah. Mostly every, what they get bummed out about is schedule. Is like, oh, didn't hear from you for a week because right. you were in South Africa. Right. And I got one email saying, hey, my phone doesn't work. Bye. <laughs> Right. Like, or like, you know, like I was having a crisis and you had no cell phone service because you were up in the mountains. Right. Or like, you know, it's Saturday night. I want to snuggle with my partner, but they have to return this email interview, um, like respond to all these text messages. Um, like, you know, it's like you want to snuggle and watch a movie, but I'm tied to my laptop. Um, right. And... That um, especially, especially the the like in town and out of town part, you know, you're in town, so you want to see them as much as you can. And yeah. then you're out of town and there's less communication. And so it's like inherently hot and cold, which can be very unhealthy very quickly. Yeah. So. Um, similar to touring yeah, musician. Yeah, like the life yeah. of a touring musician. Yeah. It's yeah. Si- very similar. Yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've dated... Or a working artist, it's, like, similar, too, because it's, like, sometimes I get swept up in this type of shit, and I and I can't... Yeah. I have no time to, like, deal, really. Yeah, it's, like, I'm, I'm working right now, and I, it's I, flowing, and I gotta do it. And I gotta do it, and yeah. it's extreme, and you gotta do it for, like, long periods of time sometimes, mm-hmm. and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I'm on, like, an organizational project... Yeah. My apartment ends up covered in, like, large pieces of paper with little bits of paper stuck to them with tape. Uh-huh. And I'm like, I'm just like, everybody leave me alone while I do my weird serial killer wall. Right. And like, I will be back in a week once I have my brain wrapped around whatever I'm working on. Yeah. Um, and it, it can be really difficult. And um, because, because there's so much footage of me having sex with people, mm-hmm. anyone who has a jealousy issue around that or... Um, some kind of like you know low self-esteem about their own sexual appeal they can go to the end of google and torture themselves right so that's that's a certain kind of fun uh, (laughs) i I find out i find out pretty quickly who Who can handle it yeah and a lot of people can't because there's so many factors did you meet your current boyfriend and girlfriend in like outside of the industry and then have to break Break it to them, so to speak. Or so the the girlfriend I was in, um, she lives out of town, and I was in her town for a um, a reading of Jiz Lee's coming out like a porn star anthology, which is where the nudie girl story is originally from. Um, and she came up to me, and first she was like, "Do you ever work with girls like me?" And I was like, "New girls? Nope." <laughs> I don't. I don't hire new performers. I don't have sex with new performers. Why? Because it's because it's amateur hour, and they're usually not really sure about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And I don't. I don't want to be part of someone's regret. Right. Um. So then <laughs> we ended up becoming friends, and then a few years later, I could kind of feel that she still had a crush. And I find her appealing. So I was like, would you super, super slick? I'm like, how do you feel about trying a dating context? <laughs> it's just like so nerdy. Um, but we, we decided to do that. And the boyfriend, I was walking home from the subway. And this brick of a man is walking the other way down the sidewalk and we make eye contact and we, we pass each other and I stop and turn around and then when he looks over his shoulder I'm like hey do you live in the neighborhood and he's like yeah would you like to get a drink wow um, you stopped and turned around 
Yeah, he was really hot. He must have been super <laughs> hot. <laughs> it's really hot. Um, and then, then we were texting a little bit, and he was like, "What do you do?" And I'm like, "Well, right now I'm um, mostly a writer. I write for Slate." And he went on Slate and found a piece by a woman with my first name, and he was like, "Is this you?" And I was like, "No, no." no. And I sent him the "How to Do It" link, uh-huh. and he's like, "Oh." And then uh-huh. we meet up for a drink, and. It, I'm like, I mentioned the porn career, and he was like, oh. <laughs> right. Um, like you just didn't know, but he, he took it like a champ. He um, he comes from an acting background and is in professional wrestling school. Oh, okay. The, like, the, like performative stuff, uh-huh. um, like WWE style. So related to, to what you do, too. It's yes. Because like, fighting and that, and then it's an act. The it's layers act. of like it's real, but it's fake, but it's real, but it's fake, but it's real. Right. <laughs> like that that whole rabbit hole he has an understanding of. Um, yeah. So that was really easy. But most of, most of the time with new people, um, there's like an hour on the first date that's like, yes, let's answer all your questions about porn. Right. Um, <laughs> so what was that like with him? Um... Mostly just chill because he, was cool he, about it. he understands the entertainment industry aspects of it. Yeah. 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 So he's open minded. Yeah. Interesting. What about some of the more dark aspects of pornography? Like in terms of just how like the destructiveness it can that it can provoke in people. You mean, do we want to talk about the like, what's your, systemic racism? Do we want to talk about or, the constant more, exposure to online harassment and the number of performers that we've lost to suicide or accidental overdose in right. the past few years that yeah. are or, linked to online harassment? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. The the utter lack of regard for performers as intelligent thinking humans, mm-hmm. um, although that is changing. Um, the God, just the, the, the performers. So John Stalliano and Rocco Sofredi kind of, um, defined what gonzo porn is. And between Stag's camera work and Rocco's performing, they make the sex look like wild and crazy. Mm-hmm. But having worked with Rocco, I must say, it's not nearly as violent as it looks it's intense Mm. it's really intense but it's it's fun and you feel like safe and secure in it Mm. um but there there are performers who will make things less pleasant than they need to be for no good reason right um and it's it's yeah, um, and it's it's sometimes it's gnarly and sometimes it's gross and you know the the tube sites have problems with age verification. All companies that sell porn have problems with age verification. You know, Great Britain kind of I think they were misguided, but they tried to develop a solution for that, and we mm-hmm. do need a solution for age verification. Yeah. Um, we also need better sex ed because. Porn cannot be sex ed. Like you, you cannot go to Pornhub and watch a bunch of porno videos there and think that you know how to have sex. Right? Um, like it's just not. There's so much important stuff that doesn't um, doesn't get shown in video because sometimes you can't show it. Like how do you show empathy in a video? Mm. Like how do you how do you mark uh, how do you mark a top seeing their submissive check out for a second? Mm. and then checking in with them like how do you how do you convey that to a viewer how do you um how do you how would a person um well actually i did that i'm like how would a person incorporate condoms in a realistic way because i think i think a lot of the problem that consumers have with condoms in porn is it like just sort of mysteriously appears Mm. like there's a blowjob happening and then a condom and then, and then there's a condom on it and it's in someone and right. like you're just like but wait like yeah. <laughs> there's a scene missing yeah like we're missing a part um That's so funny. 
there are just like all these things that you can't you can't use porn as a substitute for sex ed for yeah um so it's it's this whole like gnarly ball and we have all this hysteria around porn but that's not going to help us make better porn. That's not going to help us solve this problem. That's not going to get us better sex ed for kids right. that they're finding before they find porn. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what do you think of the idea that porn is weaponized to keep people shame-based and easily controlled? I mean, I think that sounds like really conspiracy theory. Yeah, I'm a conspiracy but theorist. If we want to walk it, <laughs> if we want to walk it back a couple of steps, right? Yeah. Shame. It's like a chicken or egg kind of situation. Shame right. is an erotic motivator for a lot of people. Oh yeah. Okay. Now you said something. So, <laughs> so BDSM uh, sort of facilitates no, that doesn't no, it no no that's really unfair to bdsm okay, you cannot sorry. it's not it's not this like kitchen sink of kink like mm. i i enjoy playing with masochism mm -hmm. you fucking degrade me we're done here mm -hmm. like do you call me a dumb little anything like mm. Just like you want to play the like everything you do is wrong game. Like, uh-uh. No, I am not there. I'm not there to be humiliated. I am not there to be degraded. Mm -hmm. I am not there to be made to feel small. Um, and so like to circle back to the very beginning with nuance around sexuality, like we say BDSM and we think of all these things and mm -hmm. we need to be more precise. So the the fact that a lot of people in the kink and BDSM scene have a strong degradation or humiliation interest, mm. that's valid. But to just point to BDSM, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we gotta have some nuance here. Um, nuance, yeah. Nuance, nuance. Devil's in the detail, it's all. Yeah, so. Um, so what were you saying about even, shame though, before like, I said BDSM? Yeah, it was gonna go, it was gonna go to the couples oriented feature market. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the mainstream porn plots are this person is cheating on this person, mm -hmm. so they hire a detective who has sex with someone along the way and then brings evidence of the cheating to the first person, and so then they have sex with the detective to, like, get vengeance, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, or, like, now there's all this, like, fake incest stuff. Right. And that's I – don't, I don't get it. I don't find it erotic. Um, people who do get it already have that market under well, control. It's yeah, and so I'm like, I want to make porno about people who are having sex with each other, and everything's above board, and mm -hmm. everyone wants to be there, and everyone's partner knows what's happening and is fine with it, and mm -hmm. there's consent all over the place. Like right. that's that's where I like to make things. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Well, yeah. At what point in your career? Did you, or what made you decide I'm gonna go and do this on my own, be my own producer, my own director, my own company, and just what was the turning point? Manwin bought Digital Playground, and I did a couple of more projects with them, and I didn't like working with them. Um, they they put me, I think it was like June or July. It was like an hour and a half out into the desert at noon in full sunlight to do a sex scene. And like, look at me. Like, <laughs> I'm not, so I'm like frying in the boiling hot Southern California desert sun. And then they sprayed sunscreen on me. But then there's like sweat dripping in the penis. And so then there's sunscreen in my, my delicate lady cavity. And that f messes up the ecosystem. And. And the next week, they're like, hey, can you shoot on Tuesday? And I'm like, my pussy is broken because of the sunscreen. And they're like, oh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'll tell you when I'm ready to come back to work for you guys. And I just never did. Um, so I decided I wanted to make something that I wanted to make. And I wanted to reference Cafe Flesh, which is this amazing project from the 80s by Rinse Dream, um, Stephen Sayadian about a world, this post-apocalyptic world, where um, most people can't stand the touch of another human. 
And those who can are pressed into service doing live sex shows for the people who can't be touched to, like, watch, to, like, experience vicariously. Um, And it's really – it's a porno about being a pornographer. Like, it's this metaphor for being a pornographer. meta. Yeah. So I made this project called Graphic Depictions. Um, And there's – it's, like, in this theater, and the the audience is all – wearing these masks so it's a bit like twitter where Mm -hmm. it's like you all know what the inside of my rectum looks like in hd and all i know about you is that you chose an egg for your avatar right like (laughs) like it's this very like imbalance of knowledge Mm -hmm. of each other um and there's um it's just this like there's there's no talking Except for like you know a few comments during sex, mm. um, and it's it's just people who have a strong look having sex with each other in these ridiculous costumes, and it's mm-hmm. like theatrical and like tacky, opulent, um, like a Fellini movie but porn. A bit, yeah. And I'm like, that's it. And I felt very good about that. Mm. And then I was like, okay, now I want to preserve. Like documentary style, Hunter S. Thompson kind of gonzo. Like what I thought when I first heard gonzo porn and then was sorely disappointed by. Um, I'm like, I want to like preserve these sexual landmarks. What's gonzo Um, porn? Gonzo, really all gonzo means is there's no plot. Mm. Yeah. It's just straight up about the fucking. Yeah, we've basically, we've got three categories, um, uh, two, two sets of categories. So there's feature and gonzo, which is plot, no plot. Mm -hmm. And then there's mainstream and feminist, queer, independent alt. Mm. Um, So you'll have queer features or mainstream gonzo. Um, But I do do feel like we could use some more nuanced categories Mm -hmm. of like what is what. Yeah. Um, Yeah. What are you working on now? Mm. Are you writing more stuff? I have a second book in the works. Um, What's is it? More essays? No, it's about dating. Oh, okay. So it's because everyone asks, nice. like, tell me about relationships. Right. I'm well, like, that's, okay. That's what everybody wants. To, I mean, that's what you want to know. Yeah, and so I'm like, because okay, let's just make a book. <laughs> I think because everybody struggles with monogamy and and all those questions around that, and so you know. It's exaggerated in someone mm-hmm. in your field. So I think we just naturally think, hey, you probably have some insight. How do you deal with that shit? And I, you know, and I, like, th- you know, like, I think I, the extreme, yeah. I think yeah. I do have insight. And um, actually, the, the format we're going to use is... Um, For the book? Yeah, the through line is like Stoya goes out into the world and learns how to be less of an asshole in romantic relationships. Uh-huh. And so we'll use my fuck-ups... And then go to actual experts and be like, <laughs> get their opinions. Get yeah, the op- opinion about how you dealt with it. Yeah, or uh, like what could be done better? What was going on under the surface? That's a good um, premise. Yeah, uh-huh. I think it'll be fun. What's that called? We don't have a title yet. We don't. We don't have a publisher yet. We're still at the proposal stage. Um, so my fuck ups is <clears throat> is a good like because that one book, what the subtle art of not giving a fuck, went mm-hmm. went ballistic. Yeah. So putting fuck in the title is maybe not a bad idea. But I'd I'd like my second book to be searchable on Amazon. Right. Unlike my first one. Yeah, but your first one doesn't have a a fucked up title. Porn in the title, though. Really? So that's it. I think that's the problem. Um, And Zero Spaces, we have been releasing an issue whenever it's ready, Mm -hmm. which is like cute, but not a viable business. Mm. So in April, we're moving to monthly releases a whole issue every month um it's just gonna be frantic you mean what um so we zero spaces does um batches of content around a theme so it's um it's like a magazine where every issue is the sex issue but with video in so you'll have like a traditional porn scene with like penis and vagina where you're like seeing that and then you'll have like more artistic or creative um 
like solo videos or um, where we're slowly building more educational content as well. And we'll have essays and photo sets. So like um, the explore issue we have, um, we have a feature on Candida Royale, who was like a, a real trailblazer in the adult industry. And then we have an interview with a woman who made a documentary about Candida. Um, and then we have Moxie, who's a certified sex educator with, I believe, a master's at this point. Um, she's in a photo set as like a pinup. And then she has an essay talking about her first experience with electricity and sex. Um, so you have like all this like stuff around a theme and we call it an issue. Um, and so that's going to be monthly, which is going to be a lot. I'm doing another play in March called The War of Wu. I'm very excited. Where's that? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> I have, well, I have an Audrey and she's like 35% of my brain. She's my assistant. Oh, I see. So I'm like, that's a good, qu oh, Audrey's oh, not where? here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Text her. Yeah. So yeah, like I'm curious about your leap from being, you know, I, you kind of touched on it, but just the leap of being a performer into being a business, like kind of a mogul type situation. I mean, you kind of have that vibe. I like, don't know about mogul. Or whatever, you're a producer, <laughs> you're you got this, you're like, you're doing, you're doing a lot. <laughs> I don't, okay, mogul might be the wrong word, but like, so, you know what I'm talking about? Like, where, what was that leap like when so you it, empowered it yourself? To it wasn't a leap. Right. First, um, first I was a performer under contract with a studio and right. I had, the PR machine backing me and I learned a lot there and Fleshlight did a deal with that company. Right. So like five of us got Fleshlights over like a period of a couple of years. Um, and then Fleshlight, I get royalties on. Mm. So unlike the porn scenes that right. I performed in, right. like when you perform in a scene for someone else, it's almost always work for hire. There's no points on the back end, nothing. Yeah. So Fleshlight, I get royalties, it's passive income, mm -hmm. which gave me the, the free time to write yeah. on Tumblr for nothing until I started getting interest for paid gigs. And at that point, it was like, you know, $50 for like a 1200 word piece. Um, right. And then because I was able to take the jobs that were going to be interesting and get exposure over the jobs that were going to pay me well immediately. I was able to build a career and Slate actually pays me pretty decently. Right. I'm, I have a contract with Slate getting paid really pretty decently for a freelance writer in 2020. Right. Um, the editor sorts through the questions for me and it's really wonderful. Um, right. And once I got the writing thing online, because I... I, I will spend money on um, I will spend money on shoes. I will spend money on lingerie. I will get a decent haircut if I'm going on camera. Um, and of course, like you know, taking care of my body and my mental health. But I don't. I'm not into fancy dinners. Mm -hmm. I don't really travel for fun. Like if I'm going somewhere for work, I might take a couple of extra days, but I rarely travel for something that isn't work. Um, I'm similar with that. So I have the passive income. That's the only way to travel. Word. It was just sort of collecting. And then at some point mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I have enough to make a porn film of my own. Right. Like I should do that. I should like yeah. see what that's like. And then. That's um, the leap. I mean, that, I is, <laughs> that is the leap because a lot of people wouldn't think that. They would think, okay, now I can get some fancy dinners. But I was always, um, you know, I was always creating content for Twitter and then for Instagram. So I was already on a small scale. Doing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it didn't, it didn't really feel like that big of a leap for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I like that aspect of social media that it basically turns – a lot of people into artists and mm -hmm. people like get finding their self expression. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> cool. Awesome. No, I want there's, you, there's, now, another, there's question? another question I have. Oh, just oh yeah, we got to wrap it up, but 
what uh, this reminded me of uh what you just said the fact that you had this little cushion of bread from the writing just a little bit of money and um stuff like that what do you think of uh do you know anything about andrew yang the politician that's that's uh that's a- oh you don't like him <laughs> the, you, i was because i was thinking about like his idea of giving everybody a thousand dollars a month like so that they can be so they can take a leap like into like starting a thing i um i think yang feels like a startup bro mm-hmm. and startup bros look at their track record mm-hmm. like yeah elon musk has gotten a lot of incredible stuff done he mm-hmm. might actually colonize mars i don't know about that but look at the man <laughs> look at the man like we work look at their trajectory and like the the bottom falling out of everything. Like look at all these mm-hmm. things. So I don't I don't really want someone who feels like a startup tech bro right. in charge of the United States government. Huh. Like the US government the US government is not the time to be experimental. Right. Like we have So who do you like? I like Warren. You like Warren? I like Warren because I know that she's asked my community for letters expressing why we're afraid of the banking bill that she was behind, why we're unhappy with FOSTA-SESTA, what the negative effects have been. Um, So when early in her campaign, she reached out, her campaign reached out to the sex worker community and wanted to hear from us. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, I I don't expect any presidential candidate to publicly back decriminalization or anything that extreme. Of, like, prostitution? Right. Yeah. But, um, well, I mean, technically, the, the precedent in New York has been set that pornography is prostitution, so I can't shoot pornography here. Oh, is that right? I can only shoot art. I, didn't I have know to that. go to Europe or L.A. or New Jersey, like, really anywhere except for New York. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, so um, you know, I, I don't expect a presidential candidate to back decrim, but the fact that someone who pushed FOSTA SESTA is now willing to hear about how maybe that was a mistake and needs to be rolled back is huge to me. Right. And Warren was the first person, as far as I'm aware, um, and then Bernie was pretty fast behind her. So f- for me those two candidates are the ones where I feel like, oh, we actually might not get thrown under the bus for once. And what's Fos- What? How do you say that? FOSTA-SESTA. FOSTA-SESTA? Um, it's, a, it's a bill that aims to reduce sex trafficking and protect the children. Okay. But here's what it's actually done. Right. It's, it's taken mo- women who had their own little... Business. Indus- yeah, only them, direct to consumer right. through Backpage or right. Eros or whatever. Right. Um, I've heard about that. And now, as soon as Fosta Sesta passed, those women started getting text messages from pimps mm, saying, right. you need me now. Right. So Fosta Sesta has actually taken women who were independent and put them in situations where mm-hmm. they are being trafficked. Right. And so it's done. It's done the opposite opposite. of what they wanted it to. And the thing is, at the end of the day, I think we can all agree on protecting people who don't want to be in sex work. Mm -hmm. But those of us who are in sex work have this idea that um, legalizing it, getting some sunshine in here, being able to do it in the open, discuss it in the open – you know, maybe even dreaming of being able to go to the police if there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, That that's what we think is the way. Right. Um, Some of us think legalization. Some of us think decriminalization. Like we can all debate the finer points. But Mm -hmm. we're like, look, if we could do this in the open, it would be safer. And some other people in the United States believe that they can stamp it out. Mm. But I think all that happens is it just gets pushed further underground. Right. Yeah. But um, the, the U S government um, Sanders and Warren and one other person whose name I'm blanking on have um, gotten together to request that the effects of FOSTA cess to be studied, mm. which is huge. That's good. Yeah. 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 Well, cool. 
Thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm did you, I did you enjoy it? I did. It was you a did? pleasant conversation. And yeah. yeah. And uh, you weren't that intimidating. I was. It was cool because I was re- listening to your essays and I was just like, oh, yeah. I was like thinking of all these things I could ask you. I like the one, too, where you like let dudes off the hook for erectile dysfunction. <laughs> she's like this is uh, a good, i listened to uh, that one yeah. oh you heard that one too <laughs> yeah my boyfriend yeah. whose identity i am very delicate around so i can say things like this sometimes he comes so fast mm-hmm. and then he feels bad about it right and i'm like that's great because i know you're gonna do it another three times right like, yeah <laughs> okay, get the first one over with quick and then yeah. we can like have fun for a get that hours. out of the way now let's get and down to business like, do this it's like an appetizer um, you should get him this book called the multi-orgasmic male okay. by man tuck chow okay yeah it's about uh yeah well it's about sexual transmutation too i guess yeah. semen retention anyway so like <laughs> I guess that's a wrap. Um, awesome. But yeah, thank you for doing it. Yeah, you weren't that, you weren't as intimidating as I thought. Cause then I started listening to some other podcasts with you. And yeah, like, like you were kind of rough on some people. When they, well, especially when they describe what you do. Yeah. Well, there was, yeah. there's come screaming out of the gate with like porn actor. And I'm like, yeah. nope. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's been a pleasure, a pleasure to meet you. And thank you. Thanks for my gift. <laughs> I can really use this. Fleshlight.com slash Stoya. Fleshlight.com slash Stoya. And, uh, and the website is... Uh, Zerospaces.com. Zero spaces.com. Yeah. yeah. And check out her book. Philosophy, Pussycats, and Porn. Yeah. Also, my Instagram has lots of pictures of Pixel and Widget who are adorable. The That's cats. at Stoya. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Nice Thank one. You. See you later. Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated.